Welcome to this morning's American Security Project webinar. This is an on-the-record conversation that will be available for attribution. A recording of this conversation will be posted on our website and sent to those who registered for the event. All audience members will be muted during the discussion, but please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions to the panelists. With that, I will turn it over to ASP President Brigadier General Stephen Cheney. Well, Matthew, thanks for that introduction. And, and let me start by saying, uh, General Nuji, thank you for your service to your country and certainly in support of ours and uh, support of NATO and your service in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, it's a phenomenally uh, distinguished career you've had. I know everybody's seen your bio here, so I won't regurgitate that, but uh, but I, I'm totally impressed and I'm so pleased to meet you. Of course, I'm, I'm a former artilleryman, so I'm pleased to meet another artilleryman as well. Uh, you know, it was, Five years ago, not quite to the day, but pretty close, it was November uh, 2016, I made a swing through Europe uh, talking about the relationship between climate change and national security. And I, I did Berlin, Brussels, and London was my last stop. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on you look at it, it was about a week after November 16th, 2016, and there was quite a bit of uproar about the United States election that had just been held. And I kept getting hammered about what's going to happen to the topic of climate change with the new administration. And, um, and I didn't know, nobody knew. And, and I, I think the incoming administration didn't know either at, at that particular time. But we were really concerned that this topic was uh, going to be pushed out and not covered in the way it should. And this is my way of saying when I, I saw the Washington Post article come out in December on yourself, I, I was thrilled. I, I thought it was a great article. It was in-depth. It was accurate uh, and, and wide-ranging. And I think it provided a pretty good background, certainly for our topic today, which is how the United Kingdom is decarbonizing defense and adapting to climate change. And I, I'd like to make some comparisons as we, as we converse between your country and ours and how we're handling this. I, I, I think we've we had a, a great lull here over the last four years, uh, five, I should say. Now, when the Biden administration came in uh, and then they started reinvigorating to a great extent climate change and, of course, the impact on security and national security, it, it's kind of taken a lot more prominence than it that it had the previous four years. So anyway, that's a little bit way of background to saying, hey, we can get this conversation going. But I was thrilled to see the article. Uh, your service is amazing. And the way you capped it off with your last appointment, I found that uh, truly unique and well done. So I, I will flip it back to you for any opening comments or remarks that you might have. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I was I was uh, very pleased with the Washington Post article and, and uh, in the UK and also in Europe, it has also been uh, very uh, remarked upon um, as um, a, a, um, a strange combination by most people's accounts of a general and climate change. And I think that this, this idea that a senior general um, in the military um, would uh, show an interest in climate change is one that has caught people by surprise, I think. And um, I mean, it isn't a surprise to me. It's entirely logical what um, what we need to do. But I think that um, what has come out of it is the opportunity uh, to really uh, make some in inroads into uh, what we need to do in terms of national security, but also what we need to do uh, in terms of adapting to climate change. So thank you for the opportunity to chat about it. And I, I, um, I have uh, 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 great um, memories and very fond memories um, of serving alongside uh, U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. I was um, part of Third U.S. Corps under um, uh, uh, General Milley um, and um, uh, under then General Joe Anderson under the 18th Airborne Corps um, as his chief of staff and then latterly as his deputy commander. So um, have enormous respect for the U.S. military and thoroughly enjoy working uh, with them. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I, I found obviously that position. I presume was unique and new uh, and, and more or less created just for you. And can you talk a little bit about how that started and how, how it got there and, and how it's going to continue? So um, it, 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 it was and it is unique. Um, I, I was coming to the end of my time as um, Chief of Defense People, so responsible for all the 
uh, military personnel, but also um, in the UK for all civil servants and veterans um, uh, in the Ministry of Defence, so about three and a half million people, about 5% of the UK population. Um, and I was coming to the end of that, having done it for four years, and, and um, uh, my successor had been appointed. And, and you'll know as well as I that once your successor is appointed, everybody's looking forward to the successor uh, uh, and uh, looking forward to the new person coming in and all the rest of it. And, and so I said to the Chief of Defence Staff, look, you know, I'll go slightly early. In fact, I've done four years. Um, I would go slightly early um, if he would allow me to do a, um, a report, a study and a survey on um, how the UK military was dealing with climate change. Because I felt whilst there were one or two projects underway, basically the UK military was not taking climate change seriously enough. And there was no central theme to it. Um, I'd been on the executive board of defence for four years. Um, and um, climate change had never crossed our desks at all. Um, and, and therefore, I felt that it just wasn't being, um, it wasn't being tackled at a senior level in defence. And I wanted to change that because I felt there was something there. I didn't quite know what at that stage, but there was something there that we needed to, to deal with. Um, and so I did ultimately a study for about nine months, um, created a something for the Secretary of State, um, uh, and then um, uh, the government responded to it. Well, that's fascinating. And I, and I presume now they're going to appoint a replacement so your work will continue. So, so, so actually, I was, I was asked to do the implementation as well. And, and, and I said no. And I said no, partly because actually when they, I was doing the report, I was um, not, uh, I, I, I didn't have the sort of huge support of an outer office or any, any money to spend or whatever. And I was worried that that would be the case for implementation. So I said, no, the, the deal is uh, I'll finish, but you are to appoint, uh, appoint a director, um, uh, so two-star equivalent, um, and a team behind, so a directorate, who will take my work forward. Um, and that's what we've done. We've now got a team of, um, it's going to be 16 strong. It's, it's 11 strong at the moment. We're still recruiting into it. And a director who's been appointed now for about eight months, um, uh, who used to work, who, who worked under me, um, uh, to try and take the whole thing forward in defence and make sure it can never be forgotten and make sure it's part of the central thinking of defence. So whilst there isn't a three-star responsible for it now, there is a whole team uh, under a two-star directly responsible for it. Well, it, I think in all senses, that's that's good news. The uh, It's certainly good news. I To put a little bit of a comparison or contrast here, the American Security Project's been working this issue uh, ever since I came on board on the board in 2006, and in, in fact, our government uh, under the Bush 43 had put climate change into, into its national security strategy. And then we had the quadrennial defense reviews, which had climate change mentioned in there. Then our national security strategy had it mentioned in there. So it, it's been in varying degrees important to our defense establishment, really since, since about 2001, 2002, it's, it's, it's been put into print. Uh, sadly though, of course, it, it varies depending on who the president is and what the administration is and what their impact is. And we, we saw, I mentioned earlier, we saw some of that under the Trump administration where the two words climate change uh, were like persona non grata. They were basically scrubbed from virtually everything. But I, I mentioned this because I know people in our defense establishment who recognize the importance of it. it. It wasn't their number one priority, but it was on the priority list not only did they understand what climate change was uh, contributing to conflict worldwide where we have to respond, but also its impact on our bases and stations. I call that the one former was strategic, the later one I call tactical. Yeah. Uh, so those who, who had to ride the waves between administrations still kind of kept that flame going, so to speak, uh, through the Trump administration, certainly. And then now, of course, it's, it's blossomed incredibly. But do you see the same thing happening, happening in administration to administration with different prime ministers happening in, in the UK with this issue? I think, I think um, less so. It's not as extreme, I think, in, in, in terms of sort of either or, or, or sort of it's on the agenda or it's off the agenda. I think, though, um, uh, what we've seen, and this, the, the, there's a really big significant issue which, which has happened uh, in the UK, which is that Theresa May, the previous Prime Minister, um, uh, put it into our laws that we would have to be net zero as a country by 2050. Uh, I think we were the first major country to do so. Um, and therefore, um, the government will be breaking the law 
if we do not reach net zero by 2050. And I think that's a very significant piece, both for the country, but actually for defence as well. And I argued very strongly, and it's been basically agreed that um, we need to do our bit to get to net zero. Um, I would argue we can get to net zero. Um, uh, ministers don't necessarily agree with that. But, but um, we need to do our bit to get to net zero by 2050, because we're 50% of central government emissions. Um, in, in the Department of Defence. Now, I don't think that's surprising at all. Actually, I'm quite surprised it's only 50%. It shows that the rest of government are producing lots of emissions as well. Um, and they don't have aircraft carriers. They don't have F-35s. They don't have tanks, all of which emit um, uh, uh, pretty heavily with their diesel engines and, and um, aviation fuel. So so to um, for, for government, to central government to make net zero, Department of Defence has to act. It has to do something. It has to reduce. But to your question, what has happened in the last really three or four years um, is that because we uh, knew we were going to be president of uh, COP, the uh, uh, Conference of the Parties, the UN uh, uh, conference up in Glasgow last year, uh, the government has been gearing itself up to, to, to paying attention to that and doing something about that. And that has created a momentum uh, that I think will now keep going because because of the legal requirement um, and um, already um, elements have been taken to court for not thinking about the emissions uh, when, for example, building a third runway at Heathrow, uh, they were taken to court and they lost in the courts and, and Heathrow had to get back to the drawing board for its third runway eventually it won in the courts. But um, this sort of legal challenge, I think, is quite an important backdrop uh, to um, where we're going as a country and therefore where defence is going. And, and uh, we could claim exemption on all of this. I would argue, and I have argued, and I think successfully, that we um, uh, that even if we have an exemption because of conflict, um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a soldier. I want, um, I, I want the freedom of manoeuvre when in conflict to be able to do the best I can for my soldiers and also for uh, winning the battle, so to speak. But out of conflict, when we are there in peace, I think there is a very respectable argument for saying that we should be doing everything we can to reduce our impact on climate change um, and so mitigate our emissions and become a, a greater circular economy and to look after the sustainability of all our land mass and the environment and so on. We have a 2% of the UK land mass where we either own or are responsible for. And I would be very surprised if the US military isn't a similar figure or even larger. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we have a responsibility towards that. Uh, but also, actually, and this, I think, is really important, the world is changing around us. I mean, we, we, we were briefly talking earlier about the Arctic. If the Arctic is going to melt in the summer completely in 15 to 20 years, which is where um, a lot of scientists think will happen, you know, what's the impact on the geopolitical environment of that? And, and, and I think, therefore, we need to be alive to this and we need to adapt to being able to operate in a climate changed world. As, and and, and as, as soldiers as well as military personnel, we need to be, you know, living and operating in the environment in which we find ourselves. Well, it's no different to operating in Iraq or oper operating in Afghanistan or operating in Africa. But the climate itself will be very different. And therefore, we need to understand that. Wow, you're you're absolutely right. I, in doing a little bit of research for this meeting, I, some would say that the Department of Defense here in the United States is the single largest emitter of carbon of CO2 in this country and perhaps the world. And and to put that into context, uh, DoD has a little more than thirteen thousand aircraft. Uh, just just think about the emissions that that causes, but. But just to make them stop emitting CO2, what you get pushback from the military is we have a mission to accomplish first. It's called defense of the country. And if we have to emit CO2 to defend the country, then we're going to emit CO2. It would be nice to reduce CO2 emissions and be able to defend the country better if you can do both simultaneously. And so my point to this is when I when you talk to the military commanders, they go, what's what's the advantage here? for us to get off of fossil fuels, for instance. And uh, we've done a lot of research with this at ASP and, and the comment I always use is General Mattis's comment 
when he was in Iraq as a, the, I think he had the commanding general of the first Marine division. He said, get me off this tether of fossil fuels. And there's been a lot of banner about how many soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines we lost guarding fuel convoys, sometimes the figure of 3000 plus, which is a staggering number, but I think that's, that's in the ballpark, so to speak. So the advantage when you go back to the military commanders is to say, hey, look, if we can find an alternative to having to truck in diesel fuel or any kind of fuels and not have to uh, rely on those, on those tankers to come in, then not only are we gonna be more efficient, but we're gonna save lives simultaneously. So this gets me to another question for you. When I looked at your report, which I really liked it. It, it. You offer solutions, you know, and you talk about the, what's the mission here. It's the same point that I was just making earlier, you know, and we get criticized at ASP sometimes from the far left that we're, we're not doing enough here. We're, we are big proponents, by the way, of nuclear power, which some don't like. We, we encourage uh, research into fusion and other alternatives here. Um, that will get us off of fossil fuels, but help improve the efficiency of our Department of Defense. And I'll give one last example. When I was commanding general at Paris Island, we relied not quite entirely, but close to the local grid for our power, which during the summer went out, not routinely, but enough. Uh, so we had an oil-fired power plant that <laughs> we used to generate our own power when the power went out. I mean, I would have loved to gotten off of that uh, dependency on the local grid, and I would have loved to have not had to burn oil to create power. And they're getting there. They've they've put in solar arrays, and there's a big program in our Department of Defense, which is called Net Zero, to have our bases and stations go to uh, Net Zero emissions, and then ultimately to generate their their own power and contribute back to the grid. But but to get back to my point about your report, which I really liked is that it was balanced. It, it took all of that into consideration. So your thoughts on that? So, so I've, um, I've, I've spent enough time, I've done 10 operational assignments um, in Iraq, Afghanistan, in Northern Ireland, and in, in, in some of the uh, world's um, uh, less favorable places. And, and um, uh, I've seen um, uh, you know, the fact that as a military person, um, you need to be, <clears throat> obviously within the law, but you need to be as unconstrained as possible by um, uh, being tethered. And I would completely agree with General Mattis's views. Uh, you know, you get me off the fossil fuels type idea. Um, uh, and he came to talk to us um, when I was with the um, uh, ACE Rapid Reaction Corps in, in uh, Germany um, uh, about um, his experiences. And, I, you know, it was a fantastic speech. But um, So I would say, um, first and foremost, it's about military capability, but there are lots of different ways of improving your military capability. Not only is it about reducing your dependent on um, uh, convoys of, of, of logistic resupply, um, and, and, and there's an important aspect there. It's not just saving lives. Um, actually, I mean, the, the most senior British officer killed in um, Afghanistan uh, was a infantry battle group commander, but he was on a logistic resupply patrol for Trek um, And that's really important. You've got infantry protecting uh, uh, resupply. You've got aviation. We had Apaches over all our resupply. Aviation supporting resupply. If we didn't have to do so much resupply, the infantry could be doing what they should be doing, which is taking the fight to the enemy. And so, uh, ditto the, the Apache. That, that there's an importance here. It's not just about reducing logistic resupply and the damage that does, but it's about releasing other assets so that they can be used for what they're really designed for as a military capability. But there's another side to it as well, which is. Um, the cost of that fuel and the cost of that fuel is 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 ridiculous and i've seen um two prices that, that perhaps broadly similar you know five hundred dollars for a, a a gallon of diesel into Kabul for the us and, and into bagram um and perhaps uh, for the uk we reckon it's about 250 pounds of um, a a gallon of diesel into helmand um and, and when when i was uh, mark millie's um uh, Chief of Staff, the first bit of the tour, which was the back end of 2013 in, in Kabul, the first bit of the tour was all about protecting convoys going down the route from Kabul to Kandahar. Um, and and the, the wrecks of uh, petrol uh, uh, tankers that had been destroyed by the Taliban. And so, so you know, this is, this is about using your um, uh, capability more effectively. It's about saving money, because if you had put solar panels into Helmand, we wouldn't have needed so much diesel and therefore 
uh, we wouldn't have needed so much resupply, but it would have saved a huge amount of money. And then there's another side to it as well, which is, you know, um, uh, there were some 42 nations or something in Afghanistan. And when we left, as a as a favor, I was, I was sort of um, uh, Joe Anderson's chief of staff and um, effectively planner for uh, uh, getting the 70,000 troops, US troops out of uh, um, Afghanistan in 2014, uh, down to the 8,000 or something that was left. Um, but when um, uh, when we were uh, uh, looking at all of that, um, what 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 became really really clear um, was that actually this uh, the, uh, it, it became really difficult to take all our equipment out. So we gave a lot of our equipment to the Afghans. But the Italians had different generators to the Spanish who had different generators to the Germans who had different generators to the Norwegians who had different generators to the Americans on a different voltage to a different generator to the British. So we left goodness knows how many different types of generators to the Afghans. Imagine trying to run your army with eight different types of generator, which needs eight different types of equipment, which needs eight different types of mechanic. It's not practical, but one set of solar panels, because they're basically the same would have been so much better uh, than, than um, uh, just lots and lots of different types. So there's lots of advantages to it, which would have been better for our allies, better for us, and save lives. And that actually is all about military capability. It's what we offer, and it's what we provide. And, and, and a lot of what I've said to uh, the UK MOD is, is, you know, if you create your own electricity, and we're subject to the same grid as you are, um, if we create our own electricity, it's doing two things. It's cr providing that resilience, which is what you needed uh, when the electricity goes off the grid, um, because we have our own supply. But secondly, importantly, it guarantees a price of electricity because you're providing your own electricity. And by guaranteeing a price of electricity, you will undercut what eventually will be rises in electricity uh, price. And that is saving you money, and that can be reinvested in military capability. That's the point. It's not just the we can use Apaches in a different way. It's you can save money, which you can then reinvest in capability. Uh, what a what a great response. And that's that's another aspect that we rarely look at is the cost saving savings ultimately. That number one and number two, the compatibility uh, between other folks' generators is just just another example that hey, if if you know if you can't use them. In between, you're you're wasting your time uh, firing up a generator. Which uh, just two quick points. When I was a artillery battalion XO, my number one concern when I was in the desert was uh, not where the enemy was or where the ammunition was. It's where is the next fuel point? Because if we couldn't move, we were dead. And uh, you you had to you had to map that out. I mean, it was a huge tactical consideration. And the other example I, I like to use is a forward operating base that's out by itself in the middle of Afghanistan that has to have some sort of power to generate their radios, their targeting. Uh, I mean, electricity is so important, uh, but, if, but if they have to lug up diesel and have a generator going, one, there's a heat signature here, and, and secondly, there's a huge cost to get it up there. If they had a way to use solar panels to uh, recharge batteries, then you've got a tactical efficiency here, and now you have a, a financial side of it that that helps too. And plus, that it uh, it saves the young marine or soldier from lugging it up and down the hill all the time. And I think there's there's there's, there's um, uh, a couple of really good examples on uh, that the UK are looking at at the moment. One is a a, a generator, a, a, a sort of new generation generator, which um, uh, is linked into a microgrid, which is linked into solar panels. Um, and, and it's really important to have a, a, a sort of microgrid with um, power storage. I mean, it's, it's a simple fact that when we turn on a generator, it carries on going the whole time. And it's optimized for um, a design of uh, producing power. What it isn't optimized for is the power that it creates. And, and yet um, a headquarters or a, um, an artillery battalion um, headquarters or whatever it is, doesn't use power completely consistently. And therefore, what you've got is a complete waste because the generator is optimized to produce power, but the uh, the recipient, if you like, the demander, isn't producing a completely consistent demand. And therefore, if you have this microgrid system and solar system, that these new generators, we've seen a 70% reduction. And these are, these are portable. 
that's 70% reduction in diesel um, usage and uh, otherwise in consumption uh, because these generators are now interspersed with or inter, um, interlinked with some sort of power um, uh, storage and uh, then power distribution. It makes a huge difference just by thinking of it slightly differently. And in exactly the same way, we've um, developed hybrid armoured vehicles, uh, small light armoured vehicles um, and logistic vehicles which aren't armoured. And by putting a battery in them, um, th there's a number of effects from that which have been really, really successful. But we've got a hybrid Jackal and a hybrid Foxhound, which is a reconnaissance vehicle and a, and a, and a small armoured vehicle. And what we're seeing is uh, the battery will provide two, two hours worth of uh, cross-country stealthily because there's no heat signature, no, no emissions um, and um, no noise signature. So that's, that's good military capability um, advancement. But actually the, uh, the amount of resupply needs is significantly less. They do have a diesel generator on board to recharge the battery, but they can do that when they are not needing stealth. When they, you know, so, so you never run out of power uh, because you have the diesel. But really importantly, the effect on the crew is that they have more situational awareness that when they're working off the batteries, um, they get less fatigue from the vibration and the, and, and the noise. Um, and so actually you get a better unit from using batteries. Um, for our logistic vehicles, um, uh, let us assume it's taking a, a field hospital on the back of this big truck. Um, the batteries um, uh, can uh, run that hospital uh, the same trucks that create, created the hospital and carried the hospital can run the hospital for 12 hours silently as they're building and as they are um, uh, getting into position, if you like, and then, then the batteries need recharging. This is, this is capability enhancement by adopting new technologies. Um, and, and it may be a little bit more expensive in the short term, but in the long term, you're getting better capability. And that must be where we're trying to get to. What, what great examples. I mean, I, I opened my eyes a little bit to it, and I certainly we could certainly use all of those capabilities here in our, in our United States military. I see we've got a couple of questions here, so I'm going to uh, open it up to questions, we, and I'll just start with one here from, I certainly recognize the author, it's General Seip, uh, who is shortly to become president of ASP. So um, his question is, General, when it comes to resiliency at the base and station level, how are the leaders at these installations thinking about, about it? And how are they planning and executing uh, with this effort? So uh, first of all, I should congratulate you. The, um, the, um, uh, my interpretation, and forgive me, this is a, a, a non-US interpretation of um, how you may best use the uh, 2016 to 2020 was to produce uh, the most comprehensive manual of resilience on all your bases, which I, which I had a look at. I, I confess I didn't read or whatever it was, a thousand pages, but um, uh, it, it was a really, really powerful manual of how you had looked at every base. And we, are, we have a, a process, it's called SIRAM, um, and the process is designed to look at the risks to a base uh, from uh, climate change. Um, and where we have the opportunity, um, they, they have to do this uh, risk assessment um, every um, every five years, um, and uh, what they what we're trying to do is is build over time, and it'll take time um, uh, because we don't have unlimited money to to spend on bases. But take time to look at uh, what are the most prevalent risks. So there's one base down on the south coast of the UK, uh, for example, it's called Thorny Island, um, where um, there were some mudflats, but they were constantly flooding and flooding the base. So what we did is we gave the mudflats. Um, so we gave the periphery, if you like, of this particular piece of coast uh, to Natural England, which is a uh, non-military uh, civilian organisation that looks after the uh, natural habitats of England, of the UK. And uh, we gave them a piece of that and said, you deal with it. The quid pro quo is they built a flood defence for us. Um, so so we, we got flood defences, which is what we needed. They got a whole load of mudflats for, for, for skipping jacks or whatever it was, the, the animals that they were particularly concerned about in that area. And so by looking at um, the optimal uh, opportunities for us, uh, then we're beginning to try and understand what are the impacts of risk. And, and take one other example, there's a, a training area called Senny Bridge, which is in Wales. Um, so we've been draining the impact area 
Um, it's an artillery impact area, but also a, a light tank impact area. We've been training the impact areas for the last 30 years. Now, what this has done is it has, um, it has allowed uh, the grass to grow and uh, dry, of course, because it doesn't rain enough, uh, which catches fire when we, uh, or has the potential to catch fire in a hot summer when we fire artillery at it. Um, so we put sheep on the grass when we're not using the impact area to try and keep the grass down. But also we get a lot of civilians walking in the area because it's a very nice area and we don't have great big fences all around. It's a huge area. Um, but also the water that is coming off is adding to the rivers, which is flooding the local areas. Um, uh, and, and so what we've decided to do is to stop draining the impact area. Now, that'll make it slightly more difficult for training. I actually don't think that's a bad thing. Um, uh, it will mean that civilians won't walk onto it. That's a very good thing. It won't catch fire, so we can use it um, 12 months of the year. And importantly, actually, as an aside, it'll sequester more carbon because um, wet ground tends to sequester more carbon than dry ground. So all now, the interesting thing for me is that we've only been draining it for 30 years. It's a bit, you know, it's thousands of years old. We've only been draining it for 30 years. So that means 30 years ago when it was still a military uh, impact area and a military uh, base, we weren't draining it. And so it's going back to where we were and actually providing slightly more difficult environments for the infantry and for, um, for armour, uh, but actually not impossible. And, and therefore, again, I think building capability, but at the same time, helping the local environment, at the same time, making it more resilient, at the same time, stopping local flooding. Wow, what a great example. The uh... I'm sure we've got several similar here in the United States with all the impact areas and bases and training that we've got going on here. I, I remember well at Camp Pendleton, and they, and they still have it here, uh, the impact area literally catching fire and, and threatening the local housing. It, it yeah. did so this past year. Uh, and so here you have climate change where they've had drought, and, uh, and, and you mentioned the fires on, on the impact area, and of course it's impacted and California, of course, had the worst forest fires in its history uh, this past year in climate change. And what ends up happening is they mobilize the military to help fight the forest fires. So it's just a, another ancillary uh, part to that. Uh, let me get to another question here from uh, Jessica Yelmo. Uh, her question is institutionalizing climate. What are the UK efforts to institutionalize climate concepts and climate language into defense training and education. And, and, and if I could embellish that a little bit, are you trying to incorporate this uh, climate change and the thoughts about climate change into your school curriculums and syllabuses? So that is our ultimate uh, objective. And I would say we haven't got as far anything like as we would like to on this. But what we are doing is running, um, one of the first things we did um, after I produced my report was uh, create a thing called the Defense Green Network, which is open to everybody where, um, we run a series of seminars, a series of lectures, a series of presentations, um, but also it is a conduit for interesting um, articles and interesting discussions outside the military uh, to be brought into the military and defense screen network. Um, uh, it, it is uh, growing almost every day with the number of people who are interested, and it's also a network of networks in the um, a whole, whole local networks on defense, um, uh, green environments, and so on. Um, are part of the Defence Green Network. So, so we're doing that, um, but we haven't yet got it into our syllabuses in, in as much as I would like. Um, it is part of, uh, say, for example, we run a generalship programme uh, for the Army where all generals, all new generals, go to the uh, generalship programme to learn how to be a general, if you like. Um, uh, it, was, it was once described to me that it was the most difficult transition you can make, apart from being a civilian into a soldier, is to get, become a general because you have to think completely differently. And, um, and so that it's part of that program. And what we're hoping is that by starting at that sort of level, I've talked to the staff college. Um, uh, so it's being incorporated, but I wouldn't say consistently yet. What we need to do is find a mechanism for incorporating it consistently and uh, encouraging uh, people to, to, to uh, uh, adopt, if you like, this as an interesting subject. Having said that, um, I was uh, emailed by a young um, sub-lieutenant in the Navy saying, um, only last week, saying, um, I'm really keen on this. Can I, can I do more of this in the Navy? And um, 
I put him in touch with the Admiral who's in charge of climate change and sustainability for the Navy, um, who immediately brought him on site um, and brought him onto his staff so that he could he could uh, actually really make a difference. So, so I think we're not there, it's not systematic yet, that takes time, um, but we're trying to push it as much as possible and opening people's opportunities. Wow. The, well, you mentioned the Navy and, and an example that I use frequently when I mentioned that ASP is a nuclear power proponent. And of course, now the hot topic are small modular reactors. And you're talking about creating a, a reactor that's small enough, portable enough that you could power a base uh, with it. Uh, a lot of there's some drawbacks here, but a lot more advantages in my in my opinion. I keep saying the prime example of a small modular reactor is a nuclear submarine. And we've been running those safely now since 1955. I mean, without a, without a single uh, incident. Uh, so I understand all that. But have, have, so is nuclear power coming into the uh, scenario at all in the UK? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, Funny enough, uh, both civilian and military. So civilian, the government has just put, I think it's 200 million pounds into uh, developing small modular uh, nuclear reactors um, as a way of, and they're, they're not portable, but, but as a way of um, increasing the amount of energy we have uh, coming into our national grid, uh, because we're going to need more and more electricity. I mean, this is, this is the, 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 the reality is that, um, uh, you know, if, if we electrify all our cars that were working on um, uh, diesel or petrol and then, um, or gas, then, then, uh, we're going to need more electricity. If we if we use electricity to heat our homes, uh, at the moment we have natural gas um, heating our homes, and so um, that is going to need electricity. So we're going to need more electricity. So they're looking at uh, modular nuclear reactors on a civilian side. On the military side, if you can put, and, and uh, there's one company, Rolls-Royce, who are looking at putting a modular reactor um, or a micro reactor, as they call it, into a 40-foot container. Um, if, you can, if you can get a micro reactor into a 40-foot container, that is uh, portable through a Chinook, then actually um, uh, via Chinook, you can, you can uh, not only do your bases back in your home country, but you can do deployed bases as well. So we're absolutely looking at that. It's not complete yet. Uh, Rolls-Royce are looking at the end of this decade to try and make sure that it is completely sorted out and it works properly and all the rest of it. But they're talking to the Ministry of Defence about that, and I think that's a really good thing. I, I'm, I'm sort of one of these people who believes that nuclear is part of the solution. I think it has to be. Um, but then so are other things like gross domestic, uh, sorry, like geothermal, um, deep geothermal and things like that are part of the equation. Um, we're not going to have a single source like we have at the moment in, in oil. Wow. Well, I, that, I, that's music to my ears, to be honest with you. And I'm glad to hear you're, you're thinking about it. I, we have gotten so far behind in the production of reactors in this country. Uh, one, they've priced themselves out of the market in, in building nuclear reactors, and uh, and they're they're trying to get onto the small modular reactor side of the house. So, uh, and, and of course, and, and you're certainly familiar with what's going on in Germany, and they're, they're basically shutting down all the nuclear power plants, which uh, and that that kind of a knee jerk reaction that they've had there. Um, so it's kind of it's very interesting problem that we have here, and there are solutions to it. We just need to work through those solutions, and it's it's good to hear that you're doing it. I'm going to ask another question here from one of our uh, uh, questioners here, and and this is from uh, uh, James Costello, and it says, uh, "What action are you taking about groundwater pollution around military facilities in the UK?" And this this is a little bit off off topic here, but uh, it's become a very hot topic here in the United States, uh, in Hawaii, where there's a, a naval base and they've had tremendous water pollution coming from the naval base. Uh, there's not a day go by, there isn't some kind of lawsuit or something you see on it. And so they're talking about bases and the pollution that the bases are creating. Uh, and it's been, it's a big problem. I mean, it really is. And Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, my, my Marine base had a problem with water pollution for years. Uh, is that? Do you have a similar problem in the UK? It's not at the same level as it obviously is in 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 the US. Um, uh, so it's not something at the top of our radar by any manner of means. But uh, what I would say is that um, we have a responsibility, particularly if we give up any um, 
give up any land uh, when we're selling it or passing it on to somebody else to make sure that it's as clean as possible. But more importantly than that, um, uh, the government has brought in um, new regulations about biodiversity, new regulations about the environment and about cleaning up the environment, which we have to respond to. So uh, as, as, as a generic rather than a specific of water pollution, um, um, and there are various areas of our training areas and all the rest of it which are polluted um, in the same way. But I, but I think that um, we have a very strong view that we have to clean them up as part of the new laws that are coming into the UK. Um, but it's not, it's not something that... Um, we are um, constantly being reminded of um, because it, it just isn't at the top of our agenda in the same way that it is in the US, obviously. You know, it's it's interesting here in the United States that uh, uh, you you can team up with the Envi Environmental Defense Fund and other organizations that actually like having military bases because in, in many cases, uh, they are good respectful of the land that they have they understand it they're conservative conservationists um, and so from that perspective in some in in many cases the, the bigger the base the more it's protected uh from other kinds of development and 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 respectful of the environment and i do you see the same kind of movement in the uk yes um absolutely we, we, we've had for some time a um a set of awards called the sanctuary awards and a a, a, a sanctuary magazine um which um, is all about how we look after the environment on our bases. We, we, we would turn around and say the Salisbury Plain, which is our biggest training area it's in the south of, uh, southwest of, of, of England, um, uh, not only does it have species that can't be found anywhere else in the country, um, it has uh, grasses that can't be found anywhere else in the country. It has not been touched by human habitation or human farming um, for, um, as in aggressive farming of, of crops and so on, um, for a couple of hundred years at the, at the very um, at the very least and so is a natural habitat that is unique in the UK and we are very proud of that um, but actually um, uh, the I, I was sort of sponsored for the sanctuary awards um, last year and I made the point that this shouldn't just be about the environment we do do a lot for our environment and we are very successful at it in small doses um, but actually the sanctuary awards should be about how we're looking after the environment gen generally rather than just in the UK. So one of the awards was uh, made last year to our Antarctic research uh, base for what they're doing in Antarctica. Um, and so, you know, we slightly widened it uh, to try and attract people's attention to the fact that the UK military, we have bases all around the world, just like the US do. And we look after our environment everywhere around the world rather than so there was one from Nepal um, with the Gurkhas, there was one from Antarctica. You know, we, we're, we're trying to look after our environment wherever we are. And um, uh, I think uh, I am biased, but I'd say we're not too bad at it. Well, that's, that's heartwarming and I, I appreciate it. We're certainly the same way here in the United States that uh, I tend to believe that our bases and stations are very good stewards of the environment, respectful of it, and, uh, and understand that's that spot. Whenever I deployed to 29 Palms in California, we had to look out for the desert tortoise. And, and we, we, we really did. I think we, we were good stewards of that. Well, I'll close with one last question. What's next for you, General? What, what, what's your next big project now that you're into retirement? So I'm, I'm still very uh, interested and very involved in this. Funny enough, one of the things I'm, I'm doing at the moment, is I'm trying to make my house as sustainable as possible. Um, so I've got solar panels. I've got a, a, a power wall, which is a Tesla power wall, which is a house battery, effectively. Um, but I'm just looking to design a, um, a new um, uh, hydro system, a water wheel. I've got a stream at the bottom of the garden, and um, I want to try and create electricity out of that. So, I, but I'm using that as almost as a sort of test bed for ideas. Um, and on this one, I get very fanciful that if I can get it to work here, then the, and it provides enough electricity just for my house then there are probably um, thousands of houses around the world that could use something similar to try and protect um, uh, or try and create its own electricity. It won't produce a huge amount, but it'll produce enough uh, just to run a house. And that sort of idea, um, getting involved in startups, getting involved in innovation, I'm firmly of the view that we'll have to innovate our way out of this problem. Um, and so supporting innovation and young startups, I'm, I'm sort of helping three or four young companies try to start up and come up with ideas of how to solve the climate change crisis. Um, not necessarily to do with the military, or they might have military things, 
that's really exciting. Well, congratulations on a fabulous career. Uh, I, again, I thought that article in the Washington Post was was spectacular. It got widespread distribution here, and 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 I and I loved it. It, it actually, if I remember right, it showed pictures of your of your home. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it it was just well done. So. Uh, let us know if we can help you out on here. If you ever come over this way, we'll certainly host you at the American Security Project. For those who are listening in, it's americansecurityproject.org. Uh, this was on the record, so we will put it up uh, online here in another day or two. And, and again, General, I appreciate your work and thank you for coming on today. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.